Welcome to How to Homeschool Radio, the show where we help new and veteran homeschoolers create a successful homeschool that works for their families. Whether you're thinking about homeschooling, just started homeschooling, or have been homeschooling for years, you've come to the right place. I'm your host, Judy Sarden, homeschooling coach, homeschooling mom of two, and author of Sarden's Practical Guide, How to Start Homeschooling. Are you ready? Let's get to it. This is Judy Sarden, and I am here with Dr. Jan Bedell. She is a neurodevelopmentalist, and she specializes in helping children's brains work better. We have already done an episode with Dr. Bedell on uh, her rapid recall system of uh, teaching your kids how to acquire math facts or helping your kids acquire their math facts. So make sure you take a listen to that episode as well. Today, we are going to talk about executive functioning. And we're going to mostly focus on uh, executive functioning with your children, but I know that there are a lot of moms out there who themselves say that uh, they have ADHD or they are struggling also homeschooling their kids because uh, they feel that they have some need in in boosting up those uh, executive functioning skills. So we're going to talk to you moms at the end, but right now we are going to let Dr. Bedell tell us a little bit about herself. Okay, well, um, like Judy said, I'm a neurodevelopmentalist, and that basically means neuro, having to do with the brain, and development. How does the brain develop, or what happens when there's a lack of development, and how you can boost that development if there was some kind of um, issue that happened along the way, Um, and that can be caused from a number of things, like cultural things that we're doing now that are different than we've done before, uh, are causing some of these symptoms that are causing many labels. Like Judy was talking about the ADHD, and uh, the labeling of our children seems to be skyrocketing. And I really believe that it has to do with the developmental things that we're doing or the lack of, just because of cultural influences. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I came about this from a need in my personal family with my daughter. My oldest had a lot of challenges. And uh, God showed me the neurodevelopmental approach through a number of uh, amazing uh, interventions. And uh, it just changed her life. And I've been doing this ever since just helping families, so identifying where the root cause of the inefficiencies are that are causing these challenges with executive function, and uh, how to stimulate the brain so that it works better. Awesome. So let's talk about just executive functioning. What, what, what does that mean? Well, uh, it's, it's interesting because I've been doing this uh, 25 years, so we're getting new uh, labels all the time. Uh, recently, well, for one thing, I've been saying something about auditory processing and how important that is to overall development and function for 20-something years. And now, just recently, there's become a label for that. And... Uh, Executive function has been known for a while, obviously, and studied, but uh, they are now, there is a disorder. They're calling it a disorder, but what their definition is, is working memory. That's, there's three main components to executive functioning, Uh, working memory, and that's keeping information in your mind so that you can put it to use. So holding pieces of information. And then there's a, the flexible thinking. That's the second area. You see a problem uh, from multiple different uh, directions, and then you learn to solve that with the best approach if, you, if your functioning is working good. And then self-control. That's the ability to stop before you respond. And uh, if you can't do that, then you're typically known as impulsive. So, um, you know, that's like impulse control, that kind of thing. Uh, I just thought of a, 
from my experience, an example of that, I worked with a young lady called Mercy, and she was 11 years old when I started working with her. She was the drama queen at her house. There were four or five meltdowns a day at, at their house. And um, a really strange thing to the family is that she could not stay at home by herself. She was afraid to stay at home by herself. Well, what we found was she had such low processing that she couldn't see the big picture of, oh, you know, they're just going to be gone for a little while. I don't have to be afraid. They always come back. You know, all those things that you think of uh, quickly to analyze a situation. She had such low processing, she couldn't do that. Well, in four months, her processing went up to the meltdowns went way down and um, she could stay home by herself. So that's just kind of an example of uh, when your brain has glitches in it and it's not working up to its capacity or its IQ because of developmental issues, then it causes those kinds of symptoms. Is that mm-hmm. making sense? Yes. And uh, you mentioned symptoms. So we spoke about this briefly uh, when we were doing the rapid recall. When we're talking about labels, uh, you say that you think that we're really talking about symptoms. So can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Okay. So most of the labels out there that are not genetic are symptomatic labels. So you have a a list, a checklist that the teacher fills out. You have a checklist that the parents fill out. And then the psychologist looks at some things too. And if there's enough symptoms on that um, that are checked off, then they call them that particular label. But what we found is there's a root cause for those things. So like, for instance, um, inattentiveness or... um, behavioral issues that are immature could be from uh, low processing, low auditory processing, holding pieces of information together so you can follow directions, stay on task, um, act mature like your particular age. So I was just going to share with you where we find those glitches that um, cause symptoms. Is that sound right? Just We'll, we'll look at neurodevelopmental perspective of this, um, all of these things that they're saying make up the executive function. So if, if you look at it from our perspective, we've got four steps to learning something, and you have to learn it before you can function. So learning and functioning starts with um, organization of the brain, and then receiving information, processing, storing it in the right place. And then the final step is utilization. So from, from what I'm looking at, the, the executive function is the utilizing part right. of this. It's really that's what everybody forward. sees. Yes, and that's what they focus on. Mm-hmm. And so if you, can, if you can get away from focusing on the problem, you know, uh, you know in your own life, if you have a problem and it's right up here, and uh, you can't, the whole world is distorted <laughs> when yes. it, it's here. But if you bring it out, you see another perspective and you go, oh, I, I see that. It's not that big a deal. I can deal with that. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have to bring it out and go, okay, what about receiving information? The first thing that the brain has to do is get information in and that's through the senses. So if there's some kind of distortion in receiving information, say they're hypersensitive to hearing Mm -hmm. and everything's distracting them, every little noise is distracting them, then that's going to cause a problem at step one of learning. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to be able to take it in as well as they that, as they should. And then processing, that's something I've really been preaching on for a long time, trying to get the information out about that. Because when, especially auditory processing, you do process verbally, that's your short-term memory is what I'm talking about here with processing. Um, you have visual short-term memory, auditory, and your brain has to, get it in, use that short-term memory before it can go into long-term memory. So it's very important. 
the more you can hold and um, process in your short-term memory, the better everything is. So with, with, um, with auditory processing, for instance, I would say the majority of the checklist for ADHD and ADD is from processing. It's the same thing. It, but if you don't process well, your behavior, you act like a younger child and you look at your child and go, you know, you're 12. <laughs> Why can't you do your chores? <laughs> They're the same ones that we do every day. Right. Um, or your checklist or something like that. So, um, it, and it's not a matter of IQ. That's what a lot of people think and, and wonder about their children. You know, are they just not very smart? And the sad thing is the children start thinking, maybe I'm not very smart because I mom thinks I should do this and can't really do it. So um, that can be a challenging thing just there from their perspective. But when they can hold more pieces together, they can see the big picture. So if, you're, if your brain is receiving the auditory information, the visual, the tactile information that it needs, then you've got step one covered in learning. But if there's glitches there, then you've got a lot of challenges. Now with processing, um, what we've seen is like with Mercy, in, in two months, her processing came up two years of ability. Wow. And so, you know, a, a, uh, more like a older child would understand, oh, I can stay home alone. It's not a big deal. So um, is that kind of making sense to yes. uh, questions specifically about what, we, what we've covered so far? Yes, yes. So I think that, so when we're talking about executive functioning, like you said, we, you've got the, the implement, implementation part of it, and that's kind of what we see. We see the kid who can't stay on task. We see the kid who um, is not acting their age. We, we, you know, we, we see the kid that's acting out, that's, that's just behaving inappropriately. So what then, as a parent... What, what can we do about it? And this is, you know, this is really key. My, my kids, when well, my son is in, um, he takes outside, he takes a couple of outside classes. And one of the things that the teacher said that she sees a lot of, the, you know, we're setting them up. He's in middle school now. So middle school and high school, we've got to set them up to learn how to keep their own calendars and to, and to stay on task and to do those things, especially in a homeschooling environment where we tend to be a little bit more relaxed. She says you don't have the teacher there telling them every day, now get your notebooks out, now write this down, you know, send it home for your parent to sign off on it, that your parent saw your uh, saw your homework and made you do it. We don't have that. And so, you know, how do we teach our kids, especially in a homeschool environment, but in general, to have to be able to see that big picture and know that they've got this checklist and to get the stuff done on the checklist. Uh, how, how do we make this happen? How, how do we do this? Well, I, I really, um, from our, our perspective, we have to get all these steps to learning. Uh, to, so we've got to step back. We've got to step back before we jump to those things. So, so when we're stepping back, what do we do? Well, um, let's look at, uh, well, for processing, for instance, you can, um, there's an auditory, free auditory test kit on our website. Uh, it's littlegiantsteps.com. And then um, brainsprints.com will be up and running in a couple of weeks, Lord willing. And there'll be a free test kit there as well at the very bottom of the homepage. Uh, so you get the test kit, find out where your child is, and then you get an aha moment of like, oh my goodness, my 12-year-old is processing like a five-year-old. No wonder he can't, you know, keep a list. Mm -hmm. he, you wouldn't expect a five-year-old to, to do that. Right. So see by this test developmentally where they are you uh it's it's five-year-olds should be able to do five it and six-year-olds should be able to do six and anybody older than seven seven or older should be able to do seven and even in our um 
you mentioned uh, adults. When I'm doing seminars and I give this test to the crowd, I tend to see uh, they, they pretty much can get six, but now when we get to seven, there's all kinds of squirming and, and uh, giggling and tension and, and everything because I think our whole society has, step, has taken a major step back um, in their auditory processing. And if you can think about it like this, we used to do all kinds of auditory activities. We listened to radio broadcasts mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for hours, you know, the generation before. And uh, we ate three meals together and we talked and we discussed and we read together. Now, homeschoolers are, are bringing this back and, and many parents that have children in school are reading to their children. But there's limited time, especially if you have two people working and there's not as much time um, to read to them. When you're listening, you're developing your auditory processing. And you might say, well, when they're watching TV, they're listening, but they're really not. Try turning the volume um, uh, covering the picture and uh, covering the TV and just let them listen you will see a huge difference in their, uh, their abilities and that they'll be confused and um, they're mostly taking in all that visually. So um, the first step is to work on that skill. Twice a day for a couple of minutes will make major inroads into their abilities and you will see new children emerging. I mean, those, those inattentiveness, being able to stay on task and, and uh, stay with their checklist or make their checklist, that will change dramatically and just by doing that. And then um, I, I would highly recommend learning more about neurodevelopment because it's also going to talk about storage of information. And I think you mentioned this, Judy, in the other podcasts about where – um, fractions, you know, they're just gone yes. every year. You back yes. uh, across them and, and they look at it like a cow at a new gate. They're just like, <laughs> why don't you teach me this? Because I've never seen it before. Yes. And I'm so puzzled. Um, yes. So storage of information is very important. So you've got uh, one side of your body is controlled by the opposite hemisphere of your brain. So the best and most efficient thing is to store information. If you're right-handed, you want to store with your right eye, right ear, and um, that way it's all in your language center when you go to write it down or where, where you speak. So if you've got a child that like you, you think they've definitely got executive functioning um, issues because they're starting to talk about something and then they just, um, there's this pause or they stutter or they, um, you know, look blank and then it comes to them and then it comes out. Well, if you're a storing, like if you're a right-handed person and storing with your left eye, mm -hmm. you're putting the information over here. And so they have to find it. And uh, it's, uh, it's kind of like storing things in a file drawer, but not putting the giraffe under G for giraffe. It's in there somewhere. <laughs> and so you've got to go through all the files and go through all the files. It's very tedious. It's very frustrating. It's discouraging to mm -hmm. have to do that. So uh, storing information in the right place is, is very important. Um, so, so, let's, let's, so let's see, let me, let me back you up. So for, for the auto, from an auditory standpoint, you're saying we can work on that simply by reading to them? And that, is it reading to them and then uh, having a dialogue back and forth afterwards? Or is it, just, is it just the passive? Because, you know, when you're reading, like right now I'm doing the I bought the illustrated Harry Potter books, even though we have the ones without the pictures. We love the pictures. I think I probably like it more than the kids. But uh, so I'm doing the read aloud. So right now we just got the latest one and I'm doing the read aloud for that. So just that sort of thing where I'm reading aloud to them. Is that because that does that kind of cover me on the auditory standpoint or do I need to that, do something else? Are, are they sitting beside you and looking at the pictures? Uh, typically I read and then if there is a picture to show, I'll show them the picture, uh, but I, I'm reading the book. Uh, it's, it's a big book. I, I couldn't read it like that. It's a huge book. So, so yeah, I'm reading. And then if there's a picture, I'll show it to him. 
I just didn't know if they were sitting beside you on the couch. Looking at the no, uh, usually I do this while they're cleaning up the kitchen or picking up. But they're usually active or even if they're not, my son has to always have something in his hands. So he mm-hmm. might be playing with his Legos while he listens right. or my daughter might even be drawing while she listens, but they laugh and they ask questions and they make comments. So I know that they're listening, right. but usually they are doing something with their hands while they listen. And that, and that's fine as long as they are able to interact with which what they do. Mm-hmm. That's so, the thing. so, so um, the main point is just listening. So if you're reading to a three-year-old or a four-year-old, you would just read to them and do what Judy just said, you know, show the picture afterwards. Don't have them looking at the picture right. while you're reading because you want it and you don't want them to read along. You know, there's books with um, where it reads it and they could read along with it. You don't want them to do that for the auditory. There is a purpose for reading with recorded books, but um, the, the auditory helping that processing is not um, is not the um, way to do that. You just want them to listen. So lots of, lots of audio books when you're not able to listen to them. A lot of people do those in the car because we homeschool and we're in the car a lot. So the audio books are good too. Right. Right. And then on top of that, working a couple of minutes twice a day on specifically intense, um, expanding their processing. So you're just going one above what they're able to do. And you just keep uh, working on that until they can do it at that level. Then you go to the next level, go to the next level. And you have exercises for this in your program, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So you have, so there are things we can do on our own and then you've got uh, exercises as part of your program that people can, um, can use as well for the auditory. Well, and we have um, just like what I call neurodevelopmental, uh, neurodevelopment in a box. So Mm -hmm. basic brain building, brain organizing and processing kinds of activities are uh, where we teach you how to do all those activities. And a lot of people can just get um, off really good um, help with that that's just generic because maybe their child just missed a little something along the way in in development because of our culture remember I was saying our cultural changes have caused a lot of this well so everything is video example, right now everything is video on the the tablets mm-hmm. the phones the tv everything is extra electronic and everything is uh is video so that's probably yeah. kind of from a cultural standpoint why, why we're lacking so much. Even the smallest kids are given a, a tablet and that's kind of their entertainment. Mm-hmm. Oh, exactly. but it has educational games on it. <laughs> but is the brain ready for those educational games? <laughs> that's, that's my point. <laughs> and the other cultural thing, since, since you brought that up, is uh, we have so many gadgets for our infants to be in very yes. early that they're not on the floor going through the developmental stages that they need to, to get the tactile information they need to get the body awareness. You know, you've got a lot of kids now that are just like bull in a China shop. They're just bumping into people, bumping into things. And because they don't know where their body is in space because they've been put in this little saucer when they were um, eight months old and they've got things right close to them, but they didn't go through the steps developmentally to know where they are in space and move their body um, in an organized way. And part of this organization, what it does is help the corpus callosum in the in the top of the brain that helps the information from one side of the brain go to the other side so that the hemispheres can communicate. Um, let me just give you an example of this. So have you ever, uh, had somebody walking close to you and you go, I know, I know that person. Yes. I cannot think her name, but I know, I know her. And she's getting closer and closer and you just say, hi. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you don't have any idea what her name is. So what happens in the brain, one side is storing a, a, a word 
but the other side is storing a picture. And your corpus callosum, the bridge on the top, isn't working too good because that, that information is not coming together to give you the name and the picture, which is the face in correlation. So it's important for the two sides to work together. There's different um, kinds of um, needs that, that each hemisphere of the brain uh, gives to a person. And um, when that or lower organization is not there, then it can cause a lot of, a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So let's say, let's talk about storage. Cause that was the next point. And I know I stopped you when you were on your list, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood kind of the sorts of things that they can do in order to help at eat each one of these stages of the executive right. functioning. So we've got the auditory. We've talked about that and the storage of information, uh, which is what you were just talking about, how uh, it's in the file cabinet, but it's not stored under the right alphabet. I love that. Uh, very easy to understand that way. So how do we help the children to, to better store the information? Uh, because that, that, that deals with the short-term memory. Right. So if you've got short-term memory issues, which is what I deal with, not me personally, my child, then when you're talking about, you know, long-term, literally three months later, I'm seeing this for the first time, even though we spent weeks on it before. And, right. you know, it, it is literally like seeing it for the first time if we get away from it for two or three months. And I am completely baffled by it. I'm doing better. But, you know, so what do you do about that, that storage component? Well, we look at, we look at dominance. Um, and just to give you an example of, of what can be done with that like in a box kind of neurodevelopment where we give you a seminar that's two hours long and it says, check your child for this, check for this. So one of the things we uh, teach you there is how to check for dominance, which we see with both eyes, but we store with one eye. And so we teach you how to test and check for that um, visual dominance, the auditory dominance, and then the foot. Uh, you start with the hands. So if your child is mixed handed, then that's the highest level of disorganization from our view. Oh, wow. So you want to have them do lots of cross pattern movement, lower level, like crawling and creeping to help that dominance come out. Now there's a, a small percentage of the population that is ambidextrous genetically, but uh, typically if a child is still going back and forth, they're probably left-handed um, and they live in a right-handed world. Mm -hmm. And so we see a lot of kids have uh, issues with that. So you start with the hand and then you want the eye and the ear to line up with uh, on that same side. So if you're sure, if, if you're sure your child's right-handed, then you could check for this and make sure which eye that they're storing with. And you, if you find that they're storing with the left eye, um, we can suggest to the brain by covering this one, you've got to use this one to store uh, because this one's not available. Oh, so wow. for academics, you could bring in information with the dominant eye and put information in, like if they're listening to audiobooks, you just have them put it in the right ear so that um, it's forcing the brain, you know, use this one, use this one and to store with, and you'll see um, that kind of thing uh, diminish. So one of the, the characteristics of a child that's not storing correctly is um, they have that inconsistent recall. They know it one day, they don't know it the next, uh, or three months later. And um, they tend to be very emotional, too. So Ooh, they yeah. go into... Yeah. <laughs> Does that ring a bell? <laughs> yes. <laughs> if they're, if they're uh, mixed dominant, they are, are very easily thrown into their subdominant hemisphere. So you have a dominant hemisphere that has your logic, your analytical thought, and your... Um, 
your language. And then on the other side, the hemisphere here is your creativity, your emotions. And so if they're mixed dominant, the, the dominant hemisphere usually, if it's working right, and uh, everything's lined up, it says to the emotions, you know, that's not a big deal. They didn't mean it. It's all okay. But if the <laughs> dominant hemisphere, that logic is not coming in and talking like it should to the emotions, the emotions just go and, and they're gone, you know, hard to calm down, easily upset. And um, then they also, when they get under stress, like in a testing situation, question it all goes out the window I mean they just don't have access to what they know Mm -hmm. and you may have experienced this yourself from time to time where you're under stress for a test when you were in school and you're you're you know you know the answer to this you Mm -hmm. you studied and see it in yellow on the middle of this page but you cannot bring it out yes and then you you test, you walk out the door, and, and there, there it is. you are. <laughs> that was it, and you're just beating yourself up. But it's that stress that puts you into the subdominant where the information's not that causes that kind of thing. So we had one young man that his mom says he wants to go to college so bad, and he scored a 14 on his ACT. Mm-hmm. Well, you can't go to college with a 14 on your ACT. And he did this basic program where he's helping the storage. He's working on the lower levels, organizing. He's working on his short-term memory, his processing. And in three and a half months, he scored a 20 on his ACT and was able to go to school. And so So that was by improving his executive functioning, improving his storage and his auditory, and um, as opposed to spending that three months taking an ACT prep class? Exactly, (laughs) because you can't really, (laughs) it's not going to, I mean, he had already been there and done that as far as the ACT prep class. Um, But it's like your brain is not functioning up to your intelligence. I call it just releasing a child's full God-given potential when their brain is organized and they're receiving information, processing, storing. All of that causes the utilization, which now apparently everybody's calling executive function. (laughs) So, okay, so we've got the the parts of... uh the things that we need to work on, the symptoms, I guess. We've got the auditory, we've got the storage of information, and what was the next one? And this kitty cat's about to make me sneeze, just for everybody. Here's La Princesa. (laughs) So if you see me keep looking down, it's because I've got this little kitten who will not, she's been on my lap for over an hour. (laughs) So uh, (laughs) She's about to make me sneeze, so sorry about that. But anyway, So we've got the auditory, we've got the storage of information. What's the next one? Well, the utilization is like the culmination of all of that. If each of these steps in learning where the information is coming in well through your auditory or visual, and then um, what, let's say, what if your tactile system is just a mess and somebody comes in and barely touches you and you just ah, like that and uh, or your your socks you know if I can just take my socks off one more time and fix that line on there maybe I can pay attention kind of thing <laughs> um, <laughs> those are distractors for everything else happening so if you're receiving all of your information tactile auditory and visual and and for those of you that are doing um, really um, emphasizing learning styles, I want, I want to encourage you. There's certain information that is better that comes in auditorily. So you want to raise that auditory skill, not say, well, my child's a visual learner and I have to teach them visually. Or, uh, heaven forbid, they're not good visual or auditory and you have to teach them tactile. Oh my goodness! How how are you going to get fractions in tactically? Yes. It's, um, it's a real challenge if you limit yourself to a learning style. So my whole philosophy is 
bring up their visual, bring up their auditory by stimulating the brain. It doesn't take very long, you know, two minutes here, two minutes there of different activities so that the, everything works better. And then the brain can choose through that plasticity of the brain. Have we talked about plasticity? I think we did in the other. I think we did in the other one, but not in this one. Why don't you uh, tell us about plasticity? Okay, so so when I first um, started in this work, the whole philosophy was, uh, and the understanding was, you know, your brain um, is is getting better and better and better to a certain point, and then it's downhill from there. It's it's stagnant. Well, um, we know now through MRIs and that kind of thing that that's that's not the case. Um, but back then. People thought we were nuts when we said we're going to stimulate the brain and build new pathways in the brain. So when you stimulate the brain with enough uh, frequency, you build a new pathway. It's kind of like building a road. And um, I know you said you're in in Atlanta, so uh, the roadways are very clogged there. And yes. when a new artery is open, oftentimes people rush to do that yes. because it's it's more and it gets them there faster. So the brain does the same thing. It builds these roadways. And so um, when you have a problem that you have to solve with executive functioning, you go, okay, what's the best way to get there? And so you're, you're able, when you've got these pathways built, you're able to pick the best way. So not winding around on these back roads, but let's take the super highway. I, uh, I, I kind of have the analogy that um, if you have a computer, it has a certain number, uh, it has a certain capacity, it has a certain amount of smarts, and it has a certain amount of short-term memory, all of those kinds of things. But if it's hooked up to DSL, like it is in <laughs> my uh, vicinity, <laughs> works a whole lot different than when that same computer is hooked up to files at our office. Sure. So uh, you see what I mean? It's the, it's the pathways that um, make the function better. So you could have this smart person that just um, has issues with information coming in. So there's a deficit there. Um, their auditory and visual processing, their short-term memory is low. And so they can only hold so much. And then they're putting it in the wrong place. Um, some people can just cope and compensate if there's one thing that's kind of off or the other. But when you have multiple things like this, then their utilization is just terrible. <laughs> so... You've given us some some ways that we can kind of work on this at home. So tell me what your what your um, executive functioning in a box is. I know that's not what you call it, but tell me what. Uh, and, and this is something that we can use with our kids, and also something if we feel like we need to improve in these areas ourselves, we can use them. I'm I'm assuming the moms or dads can use it as well. But uh, tell me about the the programs that you offer that, that help with these sorts of things and what kind of, who, who, who is this for? If you're seeing these things in your kids, then this is what would help them. Okay. So, um, first of all, I'm glad you mentioned the adults because it's never too late. That's the good news to change your brain. And you know this, if you, or if you thought about it, where a stroke victim regains function, what happens is new pathways are built around the damaged part that was caused by a stroke. So that's why they can change their function. That's that plasticity of the brain. So it is never too late. And oftentimes we uh, encourage people to do what we call developmental foundations. And the whole family can do it together. They can do the exercises for the short-term memory and um, the movement exercises for the lower level part of the brain. And the seminar that is included with that teaches you to check for dominance and and how to uh, work with that too. So we work with um, a wide range of um, 
people and conditions, you know, from Down syndrome to dyslexia to ADD to high functioning autism or even children that are uh, struggling with autism. Um, there's programs for different needs that are more individualized for more um, intense needs. And so one of the things that we offer is a free consultation. So a 15 minute free consultation, you fill out a, a little survey that lets us know some of the things that are going on. And then we can direct you to what would be best for you. And um, oftentimes we say for the adults, you know, just if you're seeing some of these things in you, um, and that's why you're so aware of them in your children, just do these activities with them. Um, adults are usually more concerned about their children, um, so they put more effort there, but um, it would do their children a big favor if they did it with them too, because then you would be more organized and you would store things better and, and process better. You would just function better overall. So I wanted to take you back to something that you mentioned about the babies not getting the tactile um, sensory input that, that they used mm -hmm. to. I know when I had, at least when I had my first, we'll talk about when I had the first baby. Uh, <laughs> we will talk about that after the second, you know, the second one is like, whatever. But um, with him, you know, I bought the wooden blocks and then I went out and I had the little mat. He, he spent quite a bit of time on the floor. I didn't have the bouncy seat or the anything like that. He, he really, he was always a, a child who liked to be mobile and liked to be moving around. So, um, so I didn't really have anything like that. And he was really good. And so, you know, when you talk about that, I think about it with my second child uh, because I had a 17 month old when she was born. Mm -hmm. I probably did more of the, uh, put in a bouncy seat plus she cried all the time and so she you know I'd she'd either be strapped to me where she wasn't mobile uh, strapped to me or in a in one of those little saucers because if she didn't have that stimulation she would cry and so it's really interesting that you mentioned that because <laughs> you know now I, I just I just wonder but I think that it's it's good, you know, and even at the playground, I notice a lot of the kids don't have the physical strength to do the monkey bars and, and, and to pull themselves up on stuff. My kids do because, you know, once she stopped crying uh, when she was a year old, she just stopped. I don't know what was wrong with her. Never, we, never, the doctors never could figure out why she was crying all the time, but she stopped. And so after that, um, she was just as mobile and active as her brother, but they've always been very active. Um, and so I know so many kids have to go to oh, to the occupational therapists now. Uh, they have trouble sitting in class, and they find out it's actually not because they're there's anything wrong neurologically. It's because they're uncomfortable because they haven't developed the muscles. So you'd mentioned that with the babies and the tactile skills. Can you just talk a bit about um, the need to let children, babies, kids? begin to get more of the, the tactile, you know, put down the games. I'm sure you can talk probably for an hour about that, but can you just talk <laughs> about it? Just, uh, you know, because you're an expert. I, I'm just an opinionated mom, but can you talk to us about that? Okay. So, uh, I mean, you're just right on. If you, if the child is not going through the developmental stages that they need to, if they're not on the floor, um, moving their arms and legs in just random movement, if they're on their back, especially, they just get the air stimulation. If they're on their stomach, you're going to feel the tile is cool and the carpet is soft and warm and you're going to get all of that that builds those pathways to, oh, this is my arm, this is my leg, this is, you know, and when you move it, you're, you can actually um, have that pathway. So can you imagine when you're going to write and you don't really know where your hand is? It's not very, very well connected. We had one little guy that said, um, they're wanting me to write this a certain way, but my hand feels fluffy. And so <laughs> He was so brilliant that he described a pathway from his brain to his hand that was fluff. How do you move fluff the way that they want you to move, right? 
<laughs> so um, here's a tip for those that have little little ones. I mean, um, we started this uh, from the time the child was like three months old. You put their hands over their your thumbs and you just gently pull them up from the sitting position. Or if they're old, a little bit older and they want up, you put their hands on your thumbs. Of course, you're supporting them. And you pull them up instead of picking them up under their arms. And they're developing their upper body strength, their hand strength. And so both of my grandchildren that we did this with, um, they started holding their pencil with a perfect tripod grip very early, like 19 years and, and more. They never did this. Um, they just picked it up like this, like those magna doodles and things like that. I don't really encourage early writing, but um, we had one of those magna doodles and, and um, I, I noticed, oh my gosh, she's holding it almost exactly perfect in the, in um, the tripod grip, mm -hmm. which is most efficient. We've, uh, the public schools have de-emphasized that too. And, uh, People's handwriting, <laughs> their hand gets tired, they're trying to shake it, and they can't take notes when they get into college because they're not holding their pencil right. So um, I'm pretty old school about that. But it, it's because, again, we've taken the monkey bars off, off of the playground. Somebody might get hurt. Yes. You know, they've taken the, the, the little merry-go-round thing off that was very good for your vestibular stimulation. Oh, yeah. I remember the merry-go-round. That was a lot of fun. My kids asked me about two years ago, what is a merry-go-round? I just pull up a, a picture on Google and show it to them. because They heard a reference to it somewhere, and I had to show them a picture of a merry-go-round. That was some fun stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's it's all of those, like I said, cultural things where we we have those slings that the baby's just happier when you're carrying them around. Um, we have the saucers that you put them in, and they just seem a little more human when they're sitting up, you know. But uh, and so we so we like that, but it's uh, really detrimental to their um, development. So what I what I say to young moms is. Um, tummy time, tummy time, tummy time. And if they're not happy with that, we've got some tools in the, in our store, uh, that will help them be more satisfied and stimulate their visual system at the same time. You can go to brain coach tips, uh, for podcasts on the subject of, um, when does homeschooling really begin, which is birth. Uh, and, and sometimes even before. And uh, that same thing, if you like your information visually, there's a um, YouTube channel that we have that's Brain Coach Tips YouTube channel. And you can search for uh, like early learning, that kind of thing to get more information about that. And in general, if you just want to know more about this receiving, processing, storing, and utilizing information, there's many podcasts and YouTube um, sessions on what what I've been teaching all this time. So there's a lot of free information out there. And um, also we can, you know, that will instruct you along the way. So that's uh, accessible for you. And um and then if you need more specific help, we do have that um, like interview process where we can help you individually look at what's best because awesome. it is kind of confusing. Well, I think that, and I'll make sure that uh, all of your links are in uh, wherever people are listening to this so that people can easily find you. So <laughs> what about say the the middle school kid and I'm and I'm asking specifically because I know you know my son's middle school so I know people in middle school what about the middle school kid who is still struggling with the uh, short-term memory issues and the uh, um, executive functioning issues will your websites help uh, will your, your your YouTube channel your programs because we just were kind of talked about the little ones so, so what what kind of things can we do with our older kids to 
to help them just, you know, around the house. Uh, you know, you told us what we can do with the babies. What can we do with kind of your middle grade kid to help them? And then uh, do you have programs that are for, for the older kids? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, remember I was telling you about that 17 year old that did the, just the basic neurodevelopment in a yes. box kind of, um, program. So that, um, the, the interesting thing is that no matter what the age of the child, if they do these, like whether they're eight or 10 or 15, if they do these uh, activities, building those pathways, then it's like their, their little smart brain goes from DSL to high speed internet. Mm-hmm. Or, or file, whatever the latest thing is. So um, it really doesn't matter how, how old you are. Even I've, ha- I've had a 54-year-old and a 55-year-old that said, well, I've seen this um, help other children. Would it help adults? And so, so they did a basic program of working on their processing, mm-hmm. uh, working on their organization and that kind of thing and their dominance. And they both went up like three and a half years in reading comprehension and they didn't do any reading. So it was not a reading technique. It was just their brain knew how to do these things, but now it was more efficient so it could do it easier and better. Well, that, that's really an excellent point, uh, Jan, because all the things that we're talking about are fixing symptoms but their reach, it's going to help all these other areas of life. And I think that that's, um, you know, why, why, why we want the diagnosis because we want to be able to help. We, oftentimes we want the diagnosis because we want to help, you know, one area of life or, or whatever, but the things that you're talking about, because they are building new pathways in the brain, uh, right. they're making the brain more efficient, help in ways. I mean, who would know that, you know, executive functioning skills would help you increase in reading comprehension or help you to increase your test scores. You know, that may not even be, I might just be trying to do this because my kid can't stay on task. Because I'm I'm, I'm focusing on that one function, but this is actually something that has far reaching ramifications in a child's life. It really is life changing. Uh, I've seen so many children that are just they're just feeling bad about themselves. They, some of them even think they're not very smart just because they're having so much trouble. But it's just because their brain is working inefficiently that that's causing that. And I was gonna I was gonna think of I was thinking of something else I was gonna say to you um, about that, and it I lost it. It so. slipped. Well, that's okay um, because I think this is really good stuff. You know, sometimes we might think that we might get a note from the teacher for kids in school, you know, your kid's low in reading comprehension or whatever, but it might not be the reading comprehension at all. It could be a storage issue or it could. Uh, so I think that that's, uh, that's something, you know, to really think about that. Just and I did. go ahead. I did think of what it was. It's like um, oftentimes people want the label because they think it's going to lead to the solution. Yes. But oftentimes it leads to coping and compensating kinds of things or special curriculum like a special reading program or something. But let me just give you an example like the Orton Gillingham um, yes. approach is phonetic. Now uh, when, when Orton said, I've identified these people that are having these issues. He said, that not all of them, but um, majority of them have some or all of these kinds of things. They have uh, processing issues. They have dominance issues. They have eye issues, balance issues, and they have phonetic awareness. Somehow along the way, everything else just kind of got (laughs) put aside and they do phonics. Well, if your processing is low and and you can't hold pieces of phonetic information together and the rule, then you have limited progress with that method. So the ones that make really good progress with that are have higher processing and that's, that's um, fixing a lot of the issues for them 
<clears throat> because of phonetic awareness. But if you've got these other issues, the eyes aren't tracking or converging together, and the, the brain is getting this kind of information, yes. this, then uh, it's not a phonetic issue at all. And so you spin your wheels doing that. But uh, people, I understand, you know, everybody's desperate to help their children. And they think if I get this label, I'm going to get the help I need because I had that, I fell into that <laughs> um, situation too. And I found that um, the IQ and the label that they gave her uh, was not uh, helpful at all to where I wanted her to function. So I was really excited when I found the neurodevelopmental approach that would go to that root level, treat the root cause, and bring her function up, that it really did change her life. And that's what I've seen happen with children over and over again. Great. I think um, I think that's all the questions I had for you. So are, is there anything else you'd like to tell us, uh, Jan, about um, your program, about your about the executive functioning skills, parent things parents should look out for. Uh, any anything else that you'd like to tell us? Well, I guess the main encouragement that I have for you is don't keep looking at the symptoms. Go that symptom is caused by something. I've got to investigate until I find out what it is, and then I've got to do whatever it takes to stimulate the brain so those new pathways are made because your child can function better. And so if we can help you with anything, uh, let us do that. And at first, just get some information from those YouTube uh, brain coach tips or uh, the podcast. And I think you'll start to see things make more sense to you. Like, Oh, that's why. And, and it, it changes the dynamics between you and your child as well. Because it can be so frustrating when you've taught them something, the light bulbs come on, and uh, you're so excited, and then you bring it out again and <laughs> look at you like, oh, what are you talking about? Yes. <laughs> and you get so frustrated and think, why is this smart child? And sometimes you say, you knew this. You, yes. I, I've taught you this. And they go, yes. oh, well, I'm be very smart because mom says she already taught me this. So it can really change the dynamics in your home too when you find out what some of these root causes are. And I know a lot of you are homeschooling because they're not getting served at school and they're struggling. So just encourage you, get some more information about neurodevelopment and um, I think it will be a lot changing for you. I just realized I forgot to ask you one thing and that is time. How much time uh, will this take? You know, the same scenario. I've got four kids, you know, four, six, eight, and ten. Uh, time. Tell me about that. How long will it take me to, every day, to get make this happen? Usually, um, the basic programs are like an hour. Now, it, some of the things that we do include math and reading, so it may take a little bit longer because it's going to just be in a more efficient way of doing it. But the thing about the hour is it's not an hour that you just spend with them, but they learn some activities and through casual observance while you're um, folding the clothes or making lunch, they're doing these short little activities on their own. So it's, it's probably um, about 20, 30 minutes that you would spend directly with them. But some of that, like I said, would be a way to improve their math and reading with specific um, kinds of techniques. Uh, so it's, um, and then some people, um, if there's severe issues, then you're, you're really spinning your wheels with some curriculum right now where the child can't handle it. So it's going to be a whole lot better to build that foundation so that the doors open, the windows come, come open, and um, all of those parts, uh, using the house analogy, would work. And I, we found that they come up really fast in math and reading oftentimes a year improvement in four months time mm -hmm. when you 
basic things. So um, it's, it's worth it to even, some people have taken off most of their academics or the extra academics, not math and reading, we definitely include those. But um, sometimes you just take off a year from some of the things, build that foundation, and then everything flows better for the rest of their life. And um, they catch up very quickly. Mm -hmm. it, that's, that's one of the things that sometimes uh, families go, oh, there's going to be a gap. There's going to be, yeah. um, you know, they have this fear of or what I call gap panic. Um, they're not going to have enough of this or enough of that. But um, it really, it's like the highway. Uh, if you need to get from, um, from this history to that history, it's a whole lot easier to go on the super highway than wind around on the, on the streets. Right, or right, or sit in the traffic jam on I-75. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to use that one. <laughs> yes, yes. You drive through Atlanta, you sometimes feel like you're not driving at all, just sitting in a parking lot. So, awesome. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bedell. I think that... Um, I think that what you're doing is awesome. And as I've said before, just talking to you and meeting you, I think we met two years ago, I really, really changed my mindset uh, with regard to working with, with my child who does struggle with the, the short-term memory issue. And I, I know that you can help a lot of people that I know, a lot of people that I talk to. So I encourage everybody listening to this to check out her her links that we will have included below. Uh, thanks again, and we will see you next time. Thanks for having me, Judy. Bye. Hey, one more thing before you go. As a valued member of How to Homeschool Radio, I want to help you and hear from you not only when you're listening to the show, but all day, every day. I have a new Facebook group called How to Homeschool, and it's a place where you can get together with other homeschooling families to get support, offer support, and interact real-time to homeschooling issues that are most important to you. If you want to be a part of this growing community, see the latest videos and get live answers to your homeschooling questions, go to judysarden.com forward slash homeschool podcast. Or you can just hop onto Facebook and search for How to Homeschool under groups. Drop me a note to let me know when you join. I can't wait to see you there.